speaking about remains of ancient advanced civilization in Africa, everybody thinks about Egypt only. But there is much more than that. Let's visit a village in Ethiopia. It is called Yeha. The ancient ruins that are found over there show amazing uh, building quality. The sides of the stones or the geopolymer blocks are digitally uh, perfectly even and smooth. They are polished. In the official mainstream history of Ethiopia, there is no culture at all that possessed any knowledge of geopolymers. And even if you argue that this is not a geopolymer work, but it is actually stonework, then it gets even worse. By worse, I mean worse in terms of credibility of this mainstream history, because to polish and cut such huge blocks, they may look small on the video, but uh, they are two and a half meters long, some of them. Uh, to polish and cut them, you need uh, high-tech equipment. This is not possible with uh, primitive tools and what to speak of copper tools. Let's see who was there in Ethiopia according to the official uh, history. We read about the Habesha local people. They do not uh, possess advanced technology and other Afro-Asiatic speaking communities that are listed here and they're all more or less primitive people. They do not even know what is a geopolymer, what is artificial stone, nor they have any knowledge of sophisticated machinery that could uh, cut and produce and polish to perfection uh, large stone blocks. Also, the building style of these um, megalithic structures, there are a few of them in Ethiopia, is very similar to this that is in Yemen. These photos are from Yemen, just for comparison. And by the way, it is absolutely the same uh, in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, in uh, Cambodia, uh, in Turkey, in Peru, as if the same builder made them all. But this builder is not at all present in the current history of Ethiopia. Why? Not to even mention the enormous obelisks in Aksum, the capital of Ethiopia. They are uh, much bigger than the famous Egyptian obelisks. And even with our uh, so-called advanced technology nowadays, we cannot erect them uh, to their previous glory. We, we had to do it in pieces. We couldn't uh, do it at once. And again, not only the weight of the obelisks, but also the technology that was used in cutting them is uh, far beyond uh, the reach of any primitive tools, no matter how many millions of slaves were laboring for hundreds and thousands of years. These achievements are simply ignored by those who write the mainstream history. They do not mention them, pretend that they do not exist, and continue writing only about mud huts. Even in the Middle Ages, people were still aware about the true history of Ethiopia. That's why this medieval cartographer depicted the ruler of Ethiopia as a typically what we are used to call a European-style king. Mainstream historians are trying to create the impression that this type of culture was uh, invented and evolved in Europe, but in reality it was a worldwide phenomenon. Ethiopia was part of the empire of the survivors, even uh, in recent times when Christianity was present. And that is why we see megaliths in the same building style as all over the world, where the empire of the survivors had one world culture and was building everywhere in the same style. And because the Caucasian people, blonde, tall people who brought this uh, culture to Ethiopia mixed with the locals, that is why still some of um, the tribal people till date have uh, crystal clear blue eyes and light hair, which is not natural for uh, their race. This ancient writing of Ethiopia is uh, basically Slavic European runes. 
Also, the local people of Lalibela, where the, stone, the famous stone temples are uh, located, still remember that uh, during the religious processions, uh, white gods would come and join. Uh, Caucasian people tall with uh, blonde hair and blue eyes. Another interesting point to consider is that the megaliths of Ethiopia are made of stone that is not available locally. The nearest uh, place where such stone can be found is Egypt. When the research group of Andreas Klaruf visited the nearby quarries where mainstream historians tell us, assure us that the stone was taken, they were surprised to find out that the stone over there has nothing to do with the stone that is used on the actual megalithic sites. And uh, the stone that is used on the megalithic sites is not even available in Ethiopia because Ethiopia has uh, never been a sea bottom and that is why this stone should not have been naturally formed over there. So it is either geopolymer, which I think is the case, which means artificially made stone, or it has been transported over thousands and thousands of uh, kilometers from Egypt or somewhere else, which is of course is not a problem as well for technologically advanced civilization that can fly heavy cargoes anywhere in the world. But it's highly problematic for primitive tribes that uh, supposedly lived on the territory of Ethiopia, according to mainstream history. This is another interesting medieval map. Again, we see some sort of Caucasian uh, ruler. The megaliths in the capital of Ethiopia, Aksum, are also very, very interesting. It is a mixture of uh, per perfectly shaped megalithic uh, blocks, hard stone, and uh, very primitive uh, raw stone work as well, as if two teams were working side by side. And that could have been very well the case, just see there mixed, it's not that the primitive was made on the top of the uh, better uh, foundation the better older for foundation. This is a very good example. Uh, it seems that the survivor builders were uh, putting their uh, megalithic um, polygonal uh, blocks. This is same like Peru. This is Ethiopia, but it looks like uh, Peru or Turkey or Japan. Absolutely same. Look at this same polygonal masonry, no gap between the stones, huge size blocks. So these are the uh, survivors and then the rest, the rough uh, low quality work beside them is uh, the work of the simple tribal people that were building alongside them. Or at least that is one of the possible scenarios. Another possibility is that um, initially the full building was uh, of high quality and it got destroyed later on. And then the tribal people tried to uh, repair it themselves. That is also a possibility. Now here another parallel with the megaliths of Yemen. They uh, basically look identical to those in um Ethiopia. The building style, the blocks, the size, just same. And we are back to uh, Aksum. The familiar megalithic underground tunnels. Enormous block, very high quality work. Everything is uh, polished. Even the sides that do not show, the sides that are facing other blocks, they are also uh, polished to perfection. That is why there is no gap, there is no mortar between the stones. And as usual we see the survivor style clamps as everywhere else in the world. Here even the original metal has survived.
Credo Mutva is an official shaman and historian of the Zulu nation. He is a widely known and respected uh, person in Africa and he still remembers the original history that people had before the new history was introduced by the West European colonialists. The original native history, as Credo Mutwe remembers it, is uh, much uh, more credible and corresponds well to the artifacts found in Africa. And the history is uh, that white gods with uh, uh, blue eyes, tall figures and uh, blonde hair were visiting regularly and were helping the local people. They were called Muzungu in Africa and on these photos you see that they were present all over the world. These are their depictions from all the continents and everywhere the same. Tall blue-eyed people were visiting with advanced technology and were educating the locals. And because they sometimes intermarried with the locals, maybe the result was something like this. These are original people of uh, tribesmen from South Africa. Well, these men, they, they look kind of uh, mixed maybe, don't they? This is a single piece of stone used in the construction in Aksum. Now look at this single stone. What was it? 20 some meters long. That is a gigantic. It definitely rivals the highest quality work uh, found in the Egyptian megaliths. This is the actual quarry from where the mainstream historians assure us that uh, this stone was taken. Well, it is a completely different color. It is reddish. Uh, look at the megaliths. They are whitish and uh, dark, like uh, black. That's not there at all in the quarry. Actually, the so-called quarry is uh, f just a few steps, very small, and this uh, red stone was only used in the primitive uh, work that we saw uh, in the castle on the top of the perfect blocks. By castle, I mean the one uh, in uh, Ksum. You see the red stone uh, in the primitive uh, masonry? That is taken from the local quarry, but not the big blocks, they are of other constitution. And these are the famous stone churches of Lalibela, again Ethiopia, that were carved uh, in the solid bedrock. In supposedly just a couple of years the full work was completed. Actually, the um, walkways around the churches are sometimes 10-15 meters wide. Doesn't look like primitive uh, people could have uh, done this, especially in uh, such a short time. Because this is uh, enormous uh, work. According to the local people, the king who the local king who ordered these uh, churches to be carved had astral contact, he felt into other state of uh, consciousness and was contacted by the white gods who told him how exactly to build the churches and where. And also, uh, according to this uh, legend again, the local African tribal people were working during the day and at night the angels were helping them. Well, that certainly makes much more uh, sense and uh, then it uh, is possible indeed to complete this task in uh, just a couple of years. And here you see the swastika symbol. It is sad indeed that this most ancient uh, symbol, the swastika, one of the main symbols of the survivors, was adopted uh, by the Nazis who had uh, nothing to do with the qualities of the culture of the survivors. They were just uh, the opposite, actually. 
I hope with time the swastika will again take its rightful place as symbol of uh, prosperity. And it is not just Ethiopia, all over the continent of Africa we find the ruins and remains from the time of the Empire of the Survivors. This resembles the Pantheon in Rome, but is in the African city of Kilwa. An ancient traveler shares his first-hand witness account of the Tanzanian city of Kilwa. It belonged to the Swahili people. people. Ibn Batota says, that's the name of the traveler, he describes it as one of the most beautiful and well-constructed cities in the world. The wall of it is in elegant build, he says. Nowadays, the ruins are complete with uh, gothic arches and intricate stonework. The culture that mainstream historians are trying to convince us that evolved in Europe or around Europe was actually worldwide and belonged to all people because it was given to them by the survivors of the previous advanced civilization. Another example, Timbuktu in Mali. We have been led to believe that ancient Africans were jumping naked after bananas while only we in Europe were building uh, things like this, but this is in Mogadishu, Somalia. This is Mogadishu some hundred years ago when people were still enjoying the culture left by the survivors for them. But after the people of Somalia accepted the new history and the new paradigm and the new advanced civilization, this is what happened to them. This is how the people of Somalia are progressing with our advanced society. Africa was well connected to the world with modern for its time ports and was minting its own coins. Coins that were used as far as Australia. At that time, the African people were respected as uh, members of this worldwide culture and were traveling freely, not as slaves. This uh, uh, clearly African person lived on the shore of the Black Sea. On a temple wall in India, it is depicted how visitors from Africa, wearing their traditional skirts, uh, have come all the way and are giving some sort of gifts, maybe, to the Indian king, who is depicted sitting on an elephant. The Africans are depicted um, on, on the ground and the giraffe is beside them. He is probably also part of the gifts. It seems African people were living also in South Arabia. They were well connected and they were building amazing things. Now this appears to be a gigantic, absolutely huge um, statue of a lady found in Guinea. Now this piece of a beautiful blue geopolymer, or in other words, man-made stone, is from Sierra Leone. Our laboratories today cannot even figure out how did they color it, how did they make it. So really the traces of the ancient advanced civilization are all over Africa and people still remember it in their, uh, now we call them legends, but uh, that is much closer to the actual history. Now these impressive walls are from Nigeria. They reach up to 20 meters height and are hundreds of kilometers long. Now this is interesting, it is still in Ghana and so much resembles the 
so-called kurgans found in Europe and Asia and also in some way the Inca and Egyptian ones. Now look at this uh, African ruler or king, I don't know who is he, important person from Benin. He looks exactly like uh, European, his uh, color and hat and outfit, everything. Well, in general, I must say, mainstream history is being quite unfair to the African continent, presenting them like uh, semi-dressed uh, people without any culture and living only in mud huts, while um, the civilization that we have is uh, attributed only to the Europeans who supposedly came up with it. No, they did, they did not come up with it. We all inherited it from uh, the old civilizations. This doesn't look like a mud hut culture to me. It's from Sudan. At this point I have to request you to view the rest of the video only in full screen mode, otherwise you will simply not see the lines I am talking about. With the canals you will see something, but later on when I start the topic of the lifelines you will see almost nothing and you will wonder what is she talking about if you are not in full screen mode. There were vast, really gigantic irrigation systems in Africa and I would like to show you only one of them. It uh, goes across several countries, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia and Angola. The canals are dead straight and go on for hundreds of kilometers. Now this is just one single canal, it is half kilometer wide. This is just huge. Now the straight lines, dead straight, go on for over 400 kilometers. And I even haven't marked all of them. This continues here as well. These are also canals. So it is much, much more. Yes, much, much more. Hundreds of kilometers. Was this uh, made by primitive uh, people living in mud houses and carrying the earth in baskets? I personally cannot believe it because First of all, the uh, amount of uh, time invested, uh, if somebody starts calculating, will reach a dead end to start with. And uh, second of all, if the work was done on ground level, most likely it would have followed the peculiarities of the terrain below it. But we don't see that, we see the lines continuing straight through uneven uh, surfaces on the ground. And that makes me think that most likely this was done from above, with some sort of equipment that um, we don't know about. Now here we see how the irrigation canals Cross some sort of, well, not mountain, but some sort of elevation. So let's see how it looks on lower level. These are hills. 
I mean, did they uh, really dig by hand to dig out the hills and remove them? No, I really don't believe this. The area covered by this particular system is uh, at least some uh, thousand kilometers in diameter. This is uh, huge. You can fit a uh, few European countries here, not small ones, some of the bigger ones. And it is not that uh, the dark Africans were just uh, sitting and waiting for the gods to culture them, they were also actively traveling all over the world. Now, the Olmecs from um, America were uh, very much international uh, mixture. Some of them are clearly African uh, and the Proofs for that start with these uh, huge stone heads, some reaching three and a half meters. If the facial features are not enough, you can see the braids on the back of some of the heads, typical African braids. And also some old uh, skeletons of the Olmecs show clear connection with the African race and so are some similarities in their uh, writing systems. Now on the right are Olmec statues and on the left is Egyptian. Just one more proof of well-developed international relations and international travel. Few more African faces from South and North America. African elephants, which never existed in uh, South or North America, are found in various locations uh, and also they come up uh, in the old uh, codexes like the Mayan codexes. They are all over, depicted all over South and North America. This is very uncomfortable for mainstream historians, so they simply never mention it. The connection between the languages uh, uh, and inscriptions found uh, in various locations in both South and North America are again proof of uh, international relations. The African Olmecs had interesting um, friends, Chinese Olmecs, wearing the typical tattoo, face tattoo, uh, which is uh, one of the worldwide watermarks of the earlier waves of uh, survivors. Or, in this case, to be more precise, people who received their culture from the survivors. The parallels are countless. Now, um, these are comparison between Chinese and Olmex hieroglyphs. Now we have successfully managed to wipe out all Aztecs which makes it very easy for the mainstream historians to tell us that they looked uh, like uh, native uh, people, like Native Americans, but the photos show otherwise. Maybe not all Aztecs were uh, Africans, maybe some of them were mixture, who knows, it was so well connected in those times. Now this is um, uh, old painting from uh, North America and here we see people of different color and all this is uh, very much uh, pre-Columbian stuff. Now this is an excellent uh, compilation of various photographs showing that uh, Africa was part of the one world culture, culture that was inherited 
from the Atlanteans. And these are more African artifacts found all over South and North America. Now these are Dogon Cliff dwellings, again from Mali. And these are cliff dwellings from North America belonging to the Anastasi tribe. Other African uh, cliff dwellings called Telem. Maybe these similarities are yet another hint that these cultures did not uh, develop independently as mainstream history is uh, trying to assure us. Dogons are very interesting people. They claim that they have connection with the beings from Sirius, the star Sirius, and it is not just uh, vain claims, they have proven it with um, astronomical data about Sirius that they could have not uh, obtained with, uh, within their primitive uh, way of life otherwise, unless somebody has given it to them. Till nowadays, the modern so-called advanced astronomers rediscover and uh, confirm again and again the connection that the Dogons have about uh, Sirius. And it is not only the Dogons, in general people in Africa, the shamans in Africa still keep the connection with the other dimensions opened. In a way, they are one of the best keepers of the old knowledge about um, the inter interdimensional capabilities of the human being. In other words, in uh, some remote, remote areas that are not yet poisoned by the parasitic uh, paradigm of life, the shamans and even the general villagers are still aware how to get through the curtain between dimensions and how to get uh, in touch with the astral world on the other side. While the people in the so-called uh, um, more developed countries are usually much more brainwashed that the astral world doesn't even exist. And uh, of course if there is nobody out there who whom are these shamans contacting anyway, if there is nobody even to contact? Despite the thousands of well-documented uh, cases that uh, shamans are indeed able to do what we call miracles, still the majority of the population of the advanced countries is simply close to this uh, full realm of uh, astral experiences just because of the mass media brainwashing. And yet another medieval castle, again in Ethiopia. Now the ancient African languages are basically part of this worldwide rune-like writing system. And the mainstream historians are so uh, busy finding uh, the differences between uh, the different types of runes and giving them uh, completely different names so that they look like a completely different writing system. They're so busy with that that they fail to make the main observation, which is that all continents, without exception, these writings are found on all continents, 
not even one is without them, that they belong to a single culture. How is it that they are assuring us that everybody evolved independently and was discovered at some point by the colonialists, and yet they were all using the same writing, even before their so-called discovery? Do you remember the strange grid lines all over the Sahara Desert? Well, they're all over Africa and actually all over the world. Let's see a few examples from the southern parts of Africa. These lines are not the modern roads. This is one example. Uh, a line, actually, this is a dam and a line next to it. Some sort of farm and modern road here this is the line um, it's definitely not another road because here is a usable road and it goes through terrain that, that uh, doesn't allow cars you know there is water there is uh, it's uneven so this uh, this is one of the many instances that proves that these lines are not some sort of modern roads. Now here a line can be compared to actual modern road. This is the modern road that is servicing these uh, power poles or whatever it is. So you can see the modern road is actually only one lane. You don't need more in the desert. It's uh, much smaller and it's uh, not straight. It follows the terrain. While the line is of completely different nature. Again, another example that shows that these are not roads. Again, here the lines are crossing terrain that is uh, not suitable for cars. And uh, also the cars would use this proper road. It has got a bridge. So these are definitely not some sort of modern uh, roads. Another example of a line crossing uh, terrain that is not suitable for a road. So these lines are not made recently as roads. This is the road, it has got a bridge and the cars can use it. This cannot be used by cars. Now, this is most likely one of the dams that is still functioning. Here we see the lines of the old infrastructure. And of course, these are modern houses. Another proof that these lines are not modern roads, here you see some sort of uh, unusual crossings and angles out there in the desert. I mean, what is the need of a crossing here? If And it's not following the terrain. If it was a car track, it would be like this. You know, there would be no need of these angles. And this is all over the desert where there is uh, nobody anyway. Yet another case showing that these lines have nothing to do with modern roads is this. First of all, this line goes through mountains here. That also gives some hint that it, it, uh, it is made by some sort of technology that uh, is not familiar to us, probably from above. Because if it was done on the ground, this would be, you know, difficult to crawl up like this and navigate in a straight line. So not only it goes uh, through mountains, but also it crosses the road here. There is no crossing. The cars are not using it. And by the way, all of the roads are probably 
most of the roads in uh, South Africa are probably uh, placed on the existing infrastructure on the top. Probably this was a broader line itself. Here are the on the side still the remains of that uh, broader line. Now this is interesting. The lines are here on very steep and not hospitable uh, terrain of uh, deserty mountains. This is how the mountains look like. And still there are lines on the cliffs themselves. Here, here. And they continue. They continue. This is uh, this is impossible for a car, for a modern car, to have uh, done this. And yet uh, the lines continue, which is uh, another proof that they were made from above with some sort of technology. So we see recent buildings, recent remains of uh, civilization on these uh, marks near these uh, lines and yet they were done from above. That means uh, that very recently somebody had at their disposal quite an advanced uh, technology and that was not at all in the faraway past. Now this is a dam in the desert, the line is leading to it. Another dam out there in the middle of nowhere, no farms nor anything in sight to suggest that it was uh, created by uh, us. And yet this is definitely a dam. Here again we have the lines all over. Kind of dams. This this must have been a very old dam. Definitely it's not a modern creation. It's so eroded. All this is in the same area, smaller dams, and maybe these were also some sort of dams. The lines again. And yet another dam, far away from any civilization or a road, modern road, I mean how could have equipment have arrived here to make it doesn't seem to have been done by us the lines continue of course everywhere and this is the dam itself and yes the lines are definitely somehow connected with the dams And uh, not far away from the dam, we can see the remains of uh, their uh, dwellings or whatever. This is definitely very old. If these were modern houses, there would be more ruins. Also, now, this is the middle of nowhere, Kalahari Desert. And what we see, lines all over. Sophisticated crossings here. Miles and miles away from any human activity. But the interesting part here are that the lines are influencing the patches of land. 
you notice this uh, plot? Its uh, vegetation is uh, different than the plots around it. That means that um, somehow these lines are influencing uh, the nature around. And the very fact that nobody maintains them also shows towards some sort of unknown to us. Um, a technology first of all they were made from above as we showed already second of all nobody maintains them and they are still there since so many years and third they are clearly showing impact on the vegetation and when the line uh, creators were in uh, artistic mood they started using the lines for drawing here we see the same lines crossing over mountains and uh, that are a, a mesh of uh, grid all over uh, at least uh, south uh, part of the African continent, these very same lines turn into pictures. This is in South Africa. And interestingly enough, these uh, patterns are found on many ancient uh, European and uh, Asian megalithic structures this very same pattern, it's a very uh, common pattern and it is combined with Nazca style painting which is yet another proof of the unity of the world culture that created all this. This is miles and miles long But here we see clearly Nazca lines style in Africa, in South Africa, Bernay Okwan. Again, ancient remains. Here are more paintings and actually many water dams. These are water dams and they are clearly related to the paintings. If somebody has doubt that the artistic stuff is separate from the lines and the um, remains of settlements, here is a clear uh, relation. The lines are going parallel to the water dam, most definitely. Many water dams. And again, this is next to the Nazca line of uh, South Africa. More ancient uh, remains of uh, some sort of... Uh, structures and somebody has put a picture about how these uh, formations look from the ground interesting well unfortunately same like with the uh, some geoglyphs in Nazca and Palpa they are not protected and actually car racing is encouraged in the region there is a lot of car racing uh, going on exactly here and uh, this um, actively destroys these uh, uh, geoglyphs rather quickly apparently out of all places on earth this is exactly the one 
where car racing should be organized in the desert. These are not car tracks by themselves though. Um, here you can judge by the size of the trees. I mean, if it was done by cars, their tires should have been uh, bigger than a tree. I think a good term for these lines would be lifelines. Like in some ancient Sumerian text, it's mentioned that the gods cleared the lifelines of the land. After all, these lines are influencing the life on the batches that they form, the batches of land. So, yes, they are lifelines. Now this is interesting, this is huge, this here, I use the ruler, is um, over uh, almost 200 kilometers long. I noticed it on the map, it's just only one of such formations, here is another one, not so clear. So I thought, what are these kind of squares, this is huge, let's zoom in. Now later on this grid will disappear. I wonder what it is. At one point I started uh, thinking maybe this is actually from the image uh, when they uh, take the shots for the map. And here by the way on the side we see real car tracks. They are not even, they are much smaller and it's a nice way to compare them with the lines. These are the lines dead straight for 200 kilometers and this I really think it's a natural car track made by the farmers. Now this is a line, the straight minor line but this I think is a natural modern car track. So here we see excellent example how the lines are influencing the nature around them. Here it's more barren and here we have more vegetation. And one more example like this. Now these are our straight lines. So this is not some uh, border where the satellite images meet and that's why the color is different. This is actual line on the ground, straight line, one of our straight lines. And really drastic difference, nature behaves differently on both sides of the line. Now, as we scroll up, I think this is now image overlap, definitely also the straight line is broken. So the difference between this and this is because they are different satellite images. But even with the, the new image, we see this patch is much darker than the neighboring patches. And also you see this, uh, these are also our straight lines and again they are making the earth different and although they don't have to follow the terrain still they are connected to things on the ground very interesting obviously this shape here doesn't need to be here for any other reason but because of this now these are historic images of the very same place from google earth Apparently, after improving the imagery, we can see much less. The older images are much, much clearer. So again, we see a patch. And these uh, lines, the lifelines, again, we see from here, if we zoom in, natural formation are starting from it natural so are they really natural
this is our straight line and again this is definitely some not some sort of image overlapping we can see the trees very well on one side of the line the trees are growing much more and on the other they are growing much much less And yet, sometimes they do nothing. Sometimes they do a lot. Very, very interesting. If you have seen my documentary, Planet of the Megaliths, you will remember the millions, really millions, of circles all over the southern part of Africa. Now, some of them are just earth formations, while others are actual stone structures. Many of them don't have uh, doors or windows and uh, are unsuitable for human habitation. This is one example of uh, one of those that do have a stone structure. That's how it looks on ground level. Now this is Peru. Over there we have uh, same lines mysterious lines and they're also connected to uh, round uh, stone structures also with unknown use and purpose. The Nazca structures are also without the doors and uh, windows and uh, also continue underground. The same is with the South African. They do continue underground and the archaeologists somehow they do not want to dig. They just uh, don't do it. Now we are back to the African circles. Since some of them are also landlines like Nazca, it will be interesting how would they connect to the uh, straight lifelines that we discovered earlier. So here are those circles. Well, it is very hard to say, but in general, my observation is that the circle land lines and the uh, dead straight land lines are more or less using the same uh, technologies, same method of influencing nature, but they are uh, done at different times and don't seem to have any connection whatsoever. The circle lines seem to be kind of uh, older generation. I was also wondering what would be the connection between the irrigation canals and the dead straight lifelines and I could not find anywhere in particular where they seem to be logically connected. I haven't searched much. But in any case, the various plots of land on the canal that are separated by the lifelines sometimes behave differently. Like uh, this is uh, almost 5 kilometer uh, canal that um, shows a kind of uh, even uh, smaller horizontal lines, again dead straight, 5 kilometers long. And here we see how the lifelines and the canals interact and um, the lifeline is showing us maybe how the canal was made by some gigantic maybe tool or I don't know what kind of uh, technology that uh, scooped the earth. And the marks left by this tool are the smaller horizontal lines that are clearly visible only on this uh, patch of land in between few lifelines. Now let's revisit the topic of the millions of circles. The biggest one is located in Zimbabwe. It is called Great Zimbabwe and the official version of it, of its history, is that nobody knows who built it and when and why and what was it. Well, when we hear in mainstream history that uh, it is a mystery or we don't know, usually that means um, you they don't want you to know who built it. The style of construction used uh, in Great Zimbabwe is very, very similar to the one of the Chachapoya people of Peru. 
This is Zimbabwe, the site is called Kami, and this is in Peru. Now the circles in Zimbabwe don't have much decoration, but this is the main one. This is in Zimbabwe, and now this is in Peru. On the right is Great Zimbabwe, on the left is the Chachapoya site from Peru. Now this is the Zimbabwe stone circle, the background picture and the small ones on the front. They are uh, same round uh, structures from the Chachapoya culture. They were both building in big circles and they look so similar. Now the bird symbol is considered the emblem of the great Zimbabwe site. It is definitely the main one over there. So what we have in the Chachapoya culture? Same. Same bird and even the same zigzag pattern. Well, this time it's on the top, not on the bottom. Now this pattern is also found in the great Zimbabwe site and in the Chachapoya site in Peru as well. Who were the Chachapoya people? They were red-haired and belonged to the Caucasian race. That is clear from their mummies that are found in Peru. Uh, we don't have skeletons from the people who built Great Zimbabwe, but we have an interesting medieval painting. Maybe this interesting African tribe from Zimbabwe had something to do with the architectural ideas of Great Zimbabwe, or maybe even building it. Why not? Of course, for mainstream history, this is unacceptable heresy and that's why they labeled it fanciful depiction. It's a typical approach that they do with all uh, ancient uh, maps and uh, sketches and drawings that don't fit their ideas. Actually, the world was a very much international place. People were traveling freely, they were mixing a lot and there is no problem if uh, there were such Caucasian tribes in Africa. Their descendants uh, would uh, look something like this. Well, so much about the earlier waves of survivors, but what about the last wave? That was in Africa as well, but it is painted in very dark colors repainted by the mainstream historians. That fairy tale that they're selling to us about the evil Muslims is pure historical fiction. First of all, not everybody who has uh, Muslim sounding names for our standard and writes and speaks Arabic is Muslim. Uh, we saw in Egypt that many of those people were Christians and actually uh, many of a lot of what we classify as Muslim is this uh, pre-Muslim era when uh, Christianity and Islam were one and the region was still Islam-Christian or Christiano-Islamic, choose whichever you like. Second of all, they were not evil plunderers, although in a degraded state they were the last descendants of the survivors and they were still keeping some sort of uh, normal life on earth and it was uh, the parasites who try to uh, create such misleading image for them so that their parasitic rule seems to be fair but if we look at the actual facts it is exactly the opposite uh, Napoleon, who supposedly brought light to Egypt, according to uh, mainstream history indeed he came there to destroy the artifacts to destroy the pyramid. He lined up his soldiers to shoot at the face of the Sphinx. That is why similar statements from mainstream history should not be taken seriously. Here we are being assured that the Ottoman Empire devastated the highlands and was deterred by the Portuguese intervention. It simply seems like another piece of propaganda to justify the colonialism. Basically, they are presenting the uh, colonialists as uh, bringers of some sort of uh, good uh, life, while in reality they are simply stealing the land and everything the locals in Africa have.
all the riches uh, now in Africa belong to multinational corporations and uh, behind uh, these sophisticated uh, legal ownership expressions are always hidden actual people who are uh, representatives of the parasitic paradigm and are paid in such a way just to promote this paradigm in the human society. As long as the Africans continue to believe this propaganda that they should surrender their land and their lives and basically everything they have to some foreigners for no reason whatsoever, they will suffer. When they decide to change their view and go back to their old beliefs that the humans have a right to own the land that they are born on, which is um, the philosophy and the uh, social way of the survivors, they will be again prosperous. Cape Town. Now, even the very plan, the original plan of the city by itself, is a proof that um, it was originally designed by the survivors, the last, the very last wave of survivors. For example, Athens, classic example, the Acropolis of Athens is the emblem of this um, antique architecture and antique cities. So this part is the old part that was originally designed by the survivor culture. Now here we see the modern parts, these more chaotic parts of Athens are modern. Yes, there are some streets, but they are not uh, so straight. And in general, I mean, the difference is visible between the relatively new quarters and the older ones. Here there is a small additional newer part contrasts with the old part. By the way, I wouldn't be surprised at all if uh, these lines of the survivor cities were made from above and not on the ground level because they don't follow the terrain so much while the streets that we make they follow existing uh, land uh, structures and terrain. It is hard to say at this point if um, Cape Town was uh, officially part of the empire of the survivors at the time it was built. That uh, country at the end uh, stopped existing around the year 1700. 75 we'll cover that in detail in the later episodes about about the empire of the survivors but in any case uh, was it officially part of it or not when it was built it was uh, surely influenced by this um, survivor building style And the same applies for the plans, the straight streets. You see them also here in Aksum, Ethiopia. And also you can clearly see how the older parts that are on the right are much more orderly and have dead straight uh, streets, while the newer ones that are on the left, uh, upper left, they look uh, rather chaotic compared to the good old stuff. Same regular streets in Timbuktu and in uh, Timgat, Tunisia.